for stakeholder engagement and social entrepreneurship in European alliances with a lot of wonderful friends and colleagues. The panel will be moderated by Anne Karen. No need to present Anne Karen because she's uh, part of Aurora since almost the beginning, basically. And Anne Karen will introduce uh, our friends. Some of them are also quite well known, like Michael and Peter Fenici, Francesca Cocco, and uh, Andrea Canonico. We will also present them uh, soon. Uh, thank you very much, and Karen, to you the floor. <laughs> thank you. Also, hello from my side, and thank you to, does it? Does it work now? Yeah, yeah. sounds like this. Welcome. What I can say is thank you to the Aurora Biennial team for organizing this and organizing the panel. I can say now you get the second dessert. A good mix of different disciplines. We have social science here, we have uh, natural science, we have uh, Mikal, with, uh, who, who started early in, in also not being only scientists, but also leader at universities. And we have three people who successfully ventured from science towards being a business and society. And what you see here in the screen is also, you know, on the one hand, I'm wearing the Copenhagen Business School hat as institutional coordinator, but I'm also one of the faces of Seismic. You see, Aurora started with equipping our, or it's still our, one of our aims, equipping our graduates with the skills and mindsets to address societal challenges with social entrepreneurship and innovation. And this is also how I started here with the idea of Seismic. What are these skills and mindsets? So we developed the seismic competencies and also the seismic survey to measure them. And in parallel, we developed the seismic courses. And there you see what you also see in the panel, students with interdisciplinary and international background working on a social entrepreneurship projects with the seismic app. And the newest kit, and now we started to reprint this officially with this biennial with seismic with a set in the middle. Um, there uh, will be also a doctoral network, so we will have uh, train young people, bring together researchers to work on social entrepreneurship and scaling. And you, here you see also the advertiser, there will be a workshop on Thursday morning. I know there is a great program and you have so many workshops in parallel, so feel free to reach out if you are interested in this. And this was my, my role as panelist, and now I switch into the... Boy. One additional slide, I switch into the world of the, of the um, facilitator. I spoke about uh, seismic competencies. What we find out was a group of 12 competencies. And what you see here, we need impact competencies to understand the sustainability problem and commit to solving it. We need entrepreneurship uh, competencies to uh, develop solutions. And, and find financial um, viable solutions. And this is also central for this pa panel, engagement competences. You need stakeholders to come on board to commit. A venture or a solution is not done by one person. You need a village. And this is also our, our aim here to look into this. And what I challenged a little bit our um, panelists to follow up according to this. Think about participatory. How do you involve people on eye level? How do you deal with this? And innovation diffusion also tells us we are sharing <clears throat> the knowledge. It's not that we say, now we have the solution now and we create barriers. No, seismic is open to everyone. And also these panelists will share their stories, their, their projects, their social innovation, and I hope I can also get them a little bit to share their success recipes that we know at least we can take home and copy for Aurora. So I will, um, at this point, give the floor to Michal to start with engagement in the university system and how to engage the, uh, the community. Buongiorno a tutti. Uh... Thank you, uh, or thank you, uh, uh, my dear friend. Uh, Anna Karen is uh, always uh, switching with me from German to English, so uh, if it happened, uh, uh, excuse us. I'm not capable and able to speak fluently in Italian, but we can try afterwards. My dear friends, uh, uh, as Anna Karen mentioned, my name is Michal, or uh, Michael. I'm not Michele, but uh, we'll try later. Uh, 
uh, Michal Malacka. I was actually from uh, the age 28 dean of the Faculty of Law. Uh, afterwards, I have been uh, vice director for foreign relations, vice director for international relations, vice director, vice director for, uh, let's say, uh, strategy. Uh, uh, I am now serving the university as vice director of, of quality or for quality strategy and regional affairs. What is important uh, from my career point of view, I was also a director of the regional authority and uh, uh, working with Bear Association and uh, all the, uh, let's say, business chambers that are important in uh, the relationship uh, uh, if we evaluate stakeholders. The question is uh, uh, not uh, actually easy to be answered, university and stakeholders, as we have actually already touched. But the most important aspect is that Aurora is dealing with that question. We all know, or as you probably also know, that we have CSR strategies, we have transfer, we have innovation, we have everything uh, from the charitable point of view already analyzed. But that's what we have discovered, because we are working with uh, Anna Karen uh, at a strategy reaching stakeholders in regions, is that all the partners in Aurora they do not have such an autonomous strategy, and we will actually try to bring it. And that's something what uh, should be born. So, uh, and we should take care about this baby because uh, this baby is important for our future, meaning Aurora and all the partners there. And uh, uh, working with universities here, you will probably laugh, but the, but, but the most important thing is that we know what does it mean, a stakeholder at the university. It is a problem, uh, and uh, I think that not all uh, members of the academic uh, actually uh, community, if they are not actually studying economy, business, management, or like that, understand that uh, in a proper way. Uh, we have discussed many times that we have partners, we have uh, actually students, we have external uh, subjects that would like to be involved in, we have uh, uh, actually transformative, innovative, and other procedures, but. Using the word stakeholder, sometimes uh, uh, in the dean's meeting they are asking me, uh, it is a problem if I am a vegetarian or vegetarian. Okay, that's not about steaks. <laughs> it's about stakeholders. So uh, we have started uh, uh, the work on the strategy, and I think uh, that uh, uh, it is important to uh, follow uh, the internal uh, conditions of the university, follow the regional conditions that we have to actually know and analyze. We have national uh, circumstances of milieus that we have to know and also international. Uh, but for Aurora, uh, important uh, uh, topics now, we are working on the regional strategy. So you all know what are the national uh, actually, uh, approaches, procedures you have to actually follow. You all know what are the international aspects you have to follow. But focusing on the regional, we have started with university city. That is our approach. Uh, two years ago, we have actually tried to change the city as a actually politically involved stakeholder. Uh, and now we are running towards the region. Uh, being uh, the regional director or director of regional authority, we are involving the uh, regional, uh, actually, political powers in and following uh, also uh, the uh, economic and business chambers, they are regional, uh, uh, inviting them into the procedure. Uh, so, in a simple sentence, the university is the leading institution and should be the leading institution in the region afterwards. It is maybe too ambitious, but why not? Actually, uh, why not? In economical, in political, in science questions, why not? I know that we need for that partners, and partners are presented here also for us. But we have to find the ways. The ways are important. We have discussed tools or instruments because, uh, as I have mentioned, we could work in a theoretical frame uh, frames, but we could also establish pillars of the strategical approach for the future. Starting with University City, ending with five or six most important stakeholder groups in the region, identified them, and developed instruction, instruments, and procedures that we have to, uh, in a standard way, to fulfill. 
And that's important for us because we have discussed healthcare, we have discussed uh, uh, political or policy aspects, municipality, region, we have discussed uh, uh, small enterprises, national uh, or multinational big enterprises, and other pillars that we would involve into the strategy. Uh, the, for me, most important uh, and uh, precious information that we could win from uh, the uh, activity we have started now is that everyone understands why is such a position of university important for the future and how could be the university involved in and what is needed to follow and reach the goals we have actually prepared. So it is not so easy to get there, but as it was mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, if we do not try, we will never come there. And that's why uh, I would like to thank you all that you have joined us today. And I would like to thank all that will follow, or what or who will follow us uh, because of the project we have before us. So maybe for the beginning, uh, Anna Karen, uh, from my side, uh, one last word. The universities are the most important institution, institution for the real sustainable development because we are starting with the wisdom, research, and our memories, the guarantees, guarantees for uh, the long-term sustainable process of the society. And I would like to keep this role in position for the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I learned that we can steal each other if we activate the micro. I just want to say that again. Thank you. Um, let's see if the other panelists agree that the university is the leader and central. <laughs> but I think it's one essential component. And I will hand over the word to, uh, to Peter, which is he's, uh, a trained uh, doctor and has also an MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation. And what I learned, you are like at the interface. Sorry. You are at the interface between uh, university research and bringing it into, uh, into pharma and connects both worlds. So, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So, the idea is really to give you, um, to address the topic of the panel uh, about four examples that comes from the experience we had. Um, I, I just show you a bit of conflict of interest. Uh, so, this is just to say, what we're going to uh, talk about today has to be seen as my personal perspective because I don't know which, which hat to answer, so take it as my personal hat so we don't fall into troubles with any of the company or institution or, or university I'm affiliated or I'm working with or for, uh, depending on how you see um, the position. Um, yeah, the other thing, yeah, yeah that's, the, that's as a matter of disclaimer. The other thing is all what you're going to hear and you will see is not being developed by ChatGPT. So it's not artificial intelligence, but it's absolutely uh, human uh, intelligence, if you want, or um, trying to transfer what we believe uh, could be the, the right uh, approach to the subject. So let's move to the first example. And here it's uh, clearly an AstraZeneca example. So research for us is clearly a social ethical uh, endeavor, right? That there is nothing that we do in, in R&D discovery that do not point clearly toward uh, patients, social needs, uh, and uh, it's clearly an entrepreneurial approach, if you like. It's one of our core, five core values, uh, being entrepreneurial in, within the company. But it's also clearly stated that it's in a collaboration with university. There is, we have an incredible team. Uh, we, we listed seven Nobel Prize in our R&D team. So we do have capacities pretty much intriguing uh, uh, as an AstraZeneca group. At the same time, we know that to really uh, be able to answer what is needed in life sciences, there is no single man or woman that can do it on his own. So it's always a matter of connecting. And here is the example of the open innovation platform we have in AstraZeneca, where essentially uh, through different challenges, a sort of co-solve approach, uh, or we call it art, uh, art uh, so it's the advancing research together. Uh, it's exactly the mindset of being able to put the highest challenge possible and ask everywhere in the world, 
is there a scientist that do have an answer smarter than ours? Yes or no? And if we don't, let's try simply to sort it out. And obviously, we're speaking about rare diseases, we're speaking about conditions that do need a solution, and pharma is there to try to bring some solutions, right? But it's always through a collaborative approach. And as you can appreciate on the, on the top right uh, and corner, there are challenges that do not just uh, engage senior scientists from top universities in the world, but it's also challenges that are sent to PhD student, postdoc. So it's really covering all the spectrum of what could be the, the smartest brain to engage with, right? This initiative has been able to unlock under millions over 10 years. That is, sounds big, may not be so big actually, but it's not money or funding that's been put by the company, but it's simply unlocking public funding uh, money like Horizon 2020, stuff like that, um, by being able to show this partnership within uh, in industry and academia. Another example I want to share with you is that when I moved back from Cambridge to Italy, I said, well, fantastic, how much researchers in Italy, and this may apply to so many other countries in Europe and probably not just Europe, how many of these scientists in the country are really known by pharmaceutical industry? Probably very fr little fraction, right? We work with the usual suspects of the big Harvard University, MIT, uh, obviously, we have it quarters in uh, Sweden, we have it in the United States, quite a few in Canada, now in Asia, um, there's been China, Singapore, so it, it's, it's a big family, right? Um, but what about other countries? What is happening in Napoli? Uh, why uh, great scientists and inventors should not be seen by uh, big pharma and be able to leverage as early as possible invention or ideas that might uh, otherwise not see big pharma uh, in general, and definitely not AstraZeneca in due time. So we set up um, an initiative called Research Allies that is essentially the idea to bring researchers together, but also institutions and people that um, take decision, even up to the government, when it comes to put money and in investment into innovation and research. So this is another initiative that started from Nearly crazy idea, as most of the project we try to bring forward and found the right team to come together. The energy, the momentum, and now has been launched last November and has the ambition to grow outside Italy because it's fine to connect Italy, but uh, as a, from a research perspective and be seen by a big pharma industry, but we need also to connect with other countries and researchers. Um, now we go, uh, we come back in house here in Naples. This is another example of where essentially the knowledge sharing of a big pharma and the R&D team in AstraZeneca has been partnering, num number one, with the National Center of uh, Gene Therapy has been just set up in Italy in November uh, 2022. And, uh, but most importantly, here with the University of Naples, where has been launched last year the PharmaTech Academy, where essentially different uh, colleagues from different uh, companies in the pharmaceutical business, as well as more than 33 universities in Italy, come together to try to find solution and develop um, therapies that are based on gene therapy or technology based on RNA. You know how important this uh, become over the last uh, few years. So what we did here is another example of partnership. We said we have one of the best uh, probably laboratory for genome editing. The guy uh, that worked in AstraZeneca invented the CRISPR-Cas9, although it didn't took the Nobel Prize simply by um, the usual academic mistakes. Um, but there is clearly a, a, an important set of knowledge. So this very young student uh, that uh, decided to join the, the Pharmatech Academy got the opportunity to not just have this guy, but a panel of eight uh, scientists that came from Cambridge, UK, and uh, uh, Gothenburg. Uh, by the way, uh, most of them grown up in uh, uh, biotech in University of Naples, Federico II, and get to the level of being uh, uh, director of labs in, in AstraZeneca. So we brought back that knowledge. Uh, we create an ecosystem where everyone understood how uh, research is done in, in the industry that has a completely different or slightly different way as compared to what is happening uh, in the academia. So if on one side you see 
uh, publication and possibly patent and maybe uh, outlining um, my, my idea to someone else. In pharma, you start from, yeah, we're going to see if we publish, but in the meantime, how this will really become a drug. And the methodology is completely different. So sharing this knowledge helped this student to understand better how we do research. On the other hand, we let them know also and understand how a marketing company works. So uh, pharmaceutical in a country often is a marketing company. It's not necessarily a research center. And most of this uh, young student didn't realize how important is regulatory, how important is marketing, how important, and they essentially apply to jobs. We hired already one of the students. We're going to have probably quite a few internships that will join us in the coming months. Uh, finally, uh, all the science, and this is a bit of um, another example, and we can then comment on the, on, on the different um, as aspect that brought us to this probably success stories. Um, science has to translate into clinical practice. We do a lot of science. There are hundreds of papers that are delivered every day if you only think of diabetes. More, more than 150 papers every day. So, but is this really changing practice? Not necessarily. So a few years ago in Cambridge, before COVID, with a couple of friends, we said, oh, let's create something that is called Cardiorenal Metabolic um, alliance so that we help doctors to understand how to move science into clinical practice. And we need this integrated approach. We need different expertise, nephrologists, cardiologists, neurologists, diabetologists coming together and manage that single person that is not just diabetic, uh, has diabetes, has a cardiovascular disease, has a kidney that doesn't work, etc. Uh, all this initiative went up to a certain point and COVID kicked. Uh, we worked very hard during COVID, uh, having a bit more time to dedicate to a project that were collateral. And then we realized to have this project to really flourish and, and work needs to go outside pharmaceutical, because otherwise there is always that kind of perceived conflict of interest. So by today, this is a, an independent trust based in South Africa that is activating centers across the globe uh, to help doctors understand how to manage patients in a more holistic way. Again, there is a huge uh, impact in terms of the social impact. And there is a, a huge effort in terms of being an entrepreneur and applying entrepreneurship here, because otherwise it wouldn't work. And uh, at the same time, you can see how even working within a pharmaceutical company can give the kickstart to ideas that then find their legs to, to work further. I think this was my last slide, so I thank you for your attention. I'm open to any question. Thank you. Thank you. So we learned from, from our first panelist, universities are central. We need, uh, learned from the second presentation, there are a lot of expertise. We need to work together. And I hope the next presentation with design thinking and technology startups will also show us how can we bring everyone to the table and work together and make these synergies work. The floor is yours, Andrea. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm Andrea Canonico, and I'm responsible for R&D processes in TechUp. TechUp is an innovative startup founded in Naples in 2019. Okay. With the mission to support uh, processes uh, between research and uh, technology transfer. Um, how we do that? We do that by connecting high level expertise coming from uh, uh, companies, university, uh, research, with business. We, uh, we provide assistance uh, in the field of the public finance, uh, direct and indirect funds uh, uh, from Europe, and uh, we, we are uh, involved in the design and management of R&D uh, interventions and technological transfer projects. Uh, we operate uh, mainly in the areas you can see in the slide. So we, uh, we are in agri-food, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, materials, biomaterials, uh, machine learning, and process, uh, uh, industrial process automation. 
uh, our model, um, our startup um, uh, was established with the, with the focus on open innovation uh, applied to R&D processes. Um, so uh, this means that we uh, apply design thinking, uh, co-design to, to this field. Um, we aim to offer technological services uh, uh, and the consulting uh, with cre creative solutions. Um, with this assumption, we, we structured a board of referee. Uh, they are experts from uh, various fields, uh, uh, from university and research entities and uh, with a focus on market and business dynamics. Uh, they are very different personalities with uh, great experience uh, also in the development of collaborative projects and uh, um, very, uh, very skilled to, uh, to have to uh, meet to the needs of companies and uh, the, world, uh, the economic world. Um, you can see you can see our referees um, and uh, the areas of competence uh, food biomaterials as I said biological materials uh, they are all different um, they have uh, different expertise different age different uh, backgrounds uh, they are from CNR National Research Council they are from university in particular are also from Federico II, they are from companies, they are from uh, startups. Um, how we apply the, the model of open innovation to R&D processes? Uh, we do it in uh, uh, several ways. The first uh, one is an approach bottom up. So we, we start from the need of the of the of the enterprise or of the uh, startup or of the association. Um, we 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 decide to assign a referee or more referees to uh, uh, identify solutions to the need. And then we proceed with the project architecture, marketing strategies, and to find uh, sources uh, of, of financing. Another approach is the, the exact opposite. So we have a top-down uh, approach. Uh, we, we, we made a selection of uh, transferable uh, technologies that are ready to, to market and that are uh, developed in, in our network. We organize a work table with the stakeholders, uh, uh, perhaps uh, companies or uh, uh, other potential stakeholders uh, interested in, uh, in the, the technologies or the area of, of, of the technologies. Uh, we define a technology transfer plan and then we, uh, the, the, the end of, uh, of this process, the result is the, a collaborative project in, uh, in, uh, in, for the most part, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with collaboration between research and um, uh, enterprises. What are our goals? First of all, build and facilitate uh, research business uh, relationships then make up for the lack uh, uh, of research and innovation within the enterprises, in particular uh, SMEs. Uh, enhance and apply, concretely apply uh, the research uh, of universities coming from university and research centers, create a stable network to promote exchange and opportunities or partnership for all the ecosystem, and find uh, creative and tailored solutions to specific technological needs. So uh, let me uh, talk about our concrete uh, uh, case of application of, uh, of the model of open innovation. Um, the context is uh, Innovation Village. It's a fair event. 
produced by Knowledge for Business in partnership with TechUp and uh, with the collaboration on the several stakeholders, uh, uh, for example, the Campania Region Department for Research, Innovation and Startups, but also the CNR all the universities of uh, the, uh, the, the region, uh, industrial districts, uh, companies, professional association. Uh, the idea is to promote exchange of needs, ideas, and knowledge between uh, private and public uh, institutions and players of the uh, innovation ecosystem. Um, so uh, the, the Fair Force is uh, an exhibition area, conferences, workshop, talks, academy, uh, with, uh, with training, professional training, uh, finance and innovation service. But the, the, the concrete uh, way we uh, discover uh, um, ideas or for, uh, for sharing the knowledge uh, is the Innovation Village Award. Innovation Village Award is a contest, a competition on innovation, and it's open to uh, professional enterprises, uh, startups, uh, but also research students and uh, association foundation. They can uh, submit uh, technologies, products, or services, or model of innovation uh, in several areas. Uh, the projects uh, must be in, uh, in line with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the SDGs of, uh, of the United Nations agenda. And they, they, were, uh, they are evaluated for uh, relevance, uh, for potential for dissemination, for uh, results achieved, but also for the capability of bridging, the, uh, for example, the gender gap. This has uh, these are the areas of innovation. Uh, we are from um, we start from cultural heritage, tourism, uh, social innovation, but also aerospace, energy, materials, uh, smart technologies, biotechnology, health, uh, sustainable agriculture, and uh, for for 2024, the um, the special area is uh, the dedicated focus on, on start cup competition that is a competition uh, that uh, involves university students and so we are very proud of this uh, our pricing figures in uh, we have collected uh, 800 projects of innovation on all uh, those areas you, you, you saw um, in particular, uh, this is a national uh, contest, so we have uh, very great participation from all the Italian regions, all the Italian uh, uh, companies and uh, territories. What are the, the goals of this, uh, this model? For innovators, they take part in a showcase event for promoting their technologies. They can participate in a game because the, the contest is, uh, is uh, structured as a game, as a competition, in which uh, um, act activate uh, different skills and, and competencies uh, compared for uh, cash prizes and services and join a network of innovation. On the other hand, for partners uh, supporting the prize, there's the possibility of uh, promoting uh, special awards and services to activate a scouting for technologies, services, or innovation model in specific areas or on specific topics. Take part in a game as a judge, as a, a coach, as a trainer, and join an innovative network uh, for partnership and cooperation projects. Thank you very much, my contact. Thank you so much. You. We have heard a lot about technology, and now we open our mind from technology and business towards society and arts. And I yes. hand over to Francesca. Good afternoon, my name is Francesca Rocco, and uh, yes, I, I will talk to you about art, but I have a schizophrenic profile because I come from innovation, so 
this is a little bit strange, but <laughs> I was called uh, uh, today. I will speak you about uh, uh, Nora Greco Foundation, that is uh, a contemporary art foundation, um, which is a piece of the last 20 years of uh, uh, contemporary art history in Naples, uh, and uh, in which uh, and. Uh, uh, in the few past years, uh, has wanted to broaden its mission from the art scenario to that of the dynamics of social and cultural transformation. That's why I was called uh, in, uh, in uh, Fondazione Mora Greco, because uh, I have this uh, um, strategic task to uh, innovate and to address uh, all the activity uh, toward the, the, social, the social impact. Um, let me say something about the foundation uh, that uh, was founded 20 years ago by uh, Maurizio Moraviego, that is a dentist, and uh, he's a, also a collector, a sort of uh, patron of arts, we, we could talk, uh, we, could, uh, we could say in this way. Um, and it started with a collection of a thousand artworks and uh, the desire of uh, making uh, this collection available to the public. That's why, that's, that's why um, he decided to uh, address to the first stakeholder, that is the public institution, you talk about the public institution, and uh, uh, here the public institution is the regional government, uh, and uh, of the, the regional Campania government. And uh, mm, that's why uh, since, uh, I think, uh, 2008, uh, the foundation has operated as a, um, under an innovative mixed public-private governance model uh, with the Campania regional government that is uh, inside the board of directors of our foundation and uh, that, uh, of course, address the... Um, uh, all, the, uh, all the activities uh, that could uh, have a, a social impact, of course. So this is very important to us, uh, have this uh, moment of uh, dialogue and confrontation with the, regional, uh, with the regional government, because we can understand how we can really uh, impact uh, on our territory. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is our headquarters that is based in uh, Palazzo Caracciolo d'Avellino. I hope that after this round table, someone of you will visit uh, the foundation because we arranged uh, a visit there. Uh, and uh, this is a palace dating back to the 16th century in the heart of uh, Naples Historic Center. Uh, this, this palace have lived uh, different lives from, from being uh, uh, a convent of nuns and uh, then a residence of aristocratic family. But uh, uh, of course we are in the center of the city and uh, uh, the city, uh, the center of the city in Naples is very, it's very strange. It's not an historic center uh, as others in Europe. Um, our city center is uh, uh, is popular, and uh, we are close to the maybe you already know these names, Sanita Forcella, that are some neighborhoods in the center of the city, very popular, and we are in a popular neighborhood. Uh, that is uh, the Anticaia. Uh, so, of course, uh, our second stakeholder is uh, the neighborhood, because uh, for us uh, it, it is our target, and they are also uh, our public, and we have uh, we, we we have to uh, do something for them. So, uh, of course, our question. Our main question has always been how contemporary art, that often is very conceptual, can speak to the people in our neighborhood. And uh, you can say maybe here this facade of the building uh, before the renovation, uh, and uh, to the right, uh, one, uh, one exhibition by Petra Feriankova. 
it was one of the first exhibitions at the, fund, at the foundation. Uh, of course, many of our artists have established a dialogue not only with the building, that is particular, but uh, also with the local community uh, during the periods of residence and through also specific activities with the Anticaia people. Uh, so many of, of them are also now around the world uh, in some artworks. And this is uh, the, the facade of the palace now. Of course, we can say that uh, uh, the foundation uh, had uh, a first impact uh, on urban regeneration in our neighborhood because uh, it was uh, a, an architect, uh, uh, of course, intervention, but also uh, a lot uh, of commercial activities set up after we 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 we, we settled there. So uh, it, it has it has been a good impact on this aspect. But uh, starting from uh, okay, this is this is the palace inside. You can see from the Greek ruins. Uh, the 16th century frescoes is uh, is very very rich of history, of course. And uh, um, starting with its original exhibition activities in recent years, the foundation has developed a mission focus on the relationship on the relationship between art and society, and uh, that's why we created an uh, educational educational department internally, which works on different strands of audience development, schools. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, at risk half in the neighborhood, migrant association, and also project that explores the relation between well-being and uh, uh, art, uh, together with the hospitals and uh, also universities. Um, of course, we do these activities with universities. So our third stakeholder is the university, of course. We have a lot of agreements uh, with uh, Federico II, with the Aurora Network, of course, and also, uh, also with the, the fine art academies, because, um, because we have some skills that are experiential, of course, but we, as well, we do uh, some research activities with university, and it's very important to us, this, uh, this kind of, uh, of work, this, uh, this research activity. Um, of course, uh, uh, what we are trying to do, so our strategic direction, uh, is, uh, um, is creating a sort of community museum. So because we, we want to open, uh, and we are opening uh, the foundation uh, to the neighborhood, to the universities, and we are also trying to activate some participatory activities. So we want not only to, uh, uh, to cooperate uh, with some partners, but would like also to uh, involve them in, uh, in co-design activities and uh, in this uh, model of participatory uh, governance, of course. And that's why, okay, you can see some, some activities uh, of the, uh, that we do in the, in, in, in the foundation with students, and also, uh, we have now launched uh, a, um, training activities on uh, immersive reality for art with the Technology Foundation. And uh, out of these activities uh, and reflections comes Eddy Global Forum. Eddy Global Forum uh, is the first international forum dedicated to the educational and social missions of museum of museums. Uh, it is an international platform that connects museum and cultural institutions, experts and educators from around the world to foster discussion and approaches, experiences and objectives uh, related to the educational and social innovation through art. Um, so in this case, we, we, we can say that uh, Art is a medium, and the museum is an agent of changing for us. Uh, now we are launching the third edition of EDI, 
uh, and uh, um, maybe we can define it uh, a sort of hub for educational uh, for, for educational approach uh, for museums. And uh, today. We, can, we have uh, more, than, more than 150 institutions from all over the, the world joining this, uh, this network. Um, this network meets uh, every year in Naples uh, for four days of intense work structured in different formats. Uh, some just for the members of the network, but uh, others are open to the, to the city and also to a uh, wider public, of course. So, uh, for example, this year we had the inspirational sessions with uh, experts in different fields uh, and also uh, uh, an interesting unconference that was a, a conference in the conference but decided by our members our members, and also uh, some workshops, uh, experiential workshops, uh, that are very uh, important for our community. Uh, I just can show you some other information. This is uh, uh, the list of participants at the 2023 uh, edition. We have an international uh, scientific committee in which you can find uh, uh, the, the MoMA, uh, the Museum of uh, Reina Sofia, uh, and other big, big uh, museums. Um, and that's it. Uh, I, I would like to um, show you this, uh, this slide because uh, it was uh, one of the reflection um, emerged from this, uh, from this forum. It was uh, a focus on uh, museums and communities. And uh, this is one of the reflections that uh, also the, our, our partners uh, have uh, continued to share during the year uh, in the distance on our web platform. And uh, that's it. Okay, these are some images. Thank you so much. I think what we can take away, I will quote you again, universities are central. And I think what you also often see, they are one of the biggest employer in the city where they are, but also you have a lot of alumni and you create like an ecosystem around. We need bridges to, to get together and also certain, um, I would say safe places. But what I liked, especially from the last presentation was not only go for put some experts in the room and give them the language to speak to each other, but also make it open for the public. And there was one thing on the picture, engage everybody and, and also open it up to the community. And I think when you go home, you are, how to say, infiltrated by Aurora, but you also have seen my plan to make this panel short and more interactive, but I didn't want it to jump in in the, the interesting content. How can we communicate Aurora so concise that the people afterwards say, hey, my university is part of this cool universe, and I see this is also what we learned from the, um, from the panelists, especially from your presentation and also Andreas, where are the synergies? Where can I connect to this universe? <clears throat> and this is maybe a question also for you. How can we not, how can we better communicate Aurora? But how can we, uh, we make it more open? But what was also, or maybe what was the learning, especially for your last project? I see the business model for some of the cases, but I think for involving the community, how do I get the resources and not only invite people which are able to pay a fee to come to invent, but also get maybe people who say, ah, Kaichen Museum, that's not for me. But on the one you want also, on the other hand, you also want to have these, these people on the table. And that we also can, can benefit from the expertise in the room. So I would ask you, could you make this maybe in a one sentence statement? <laughs> and maybe I will give Francesca the, the chance to respond first. <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> um, okay, I think that uh, something we learned from Eddie, for example, is that uh, uh, we have uh, an international community of professionals very active 
and uh, uh, really engaged on different fields. So um, each one has different uh, um, backgrounds, uh, uh, different museums, uh, different interests, different engagement. For example, someone was uh, engaged in uh, uh, decolonizing museums, other were engaged in uh, gender policies and so on. Uh, but I think that, uh, for example, we had mixed all these experiences and uh, mm, they are really thrilled every year to come to Naples because they can find something that uh, they cannot find mm, any, anywhere. So they, um, they share experiences um, and in, in a completely creative contest. So this is very important to them, and they come back home uh, with uh, some uh, ideas, uh, some uh, uh, partnerships, uh, and also um, and also a, a lot of projects. So I think that is the uh, the strength of this network, and maybe it could be also a way for involving more. Uh, so find the inspiring synergies and use your network to spread the message like this. Okay. <clears throat> our effort, our, uh, our um, everyday activity is focused, as I said, on uh, the process of the open innovation. Um, we think that at the base of this process should be the people, competence, skills, and uh, cross-contamination, cross-fertilization between knowledge and competence, different competences. Um, so we, we have an approach that, is, that we can define human-centered. And uh, we uh, often uh, talk about of tech humanism. Uh, we think that at the base of, uh, of this process, can be a R&D process or a decision making process or other kind of process should be the, the sustain the ideas of tech humanism, sustainable development and social innovation. So, as I said, we launched this prize, this contest that, that is not only a contest, it's a way to discover sustainable innovation, to engage researchers, students, innovators, not also companies uh, or startups, but also not formalized research, uh, not, not, uh, not defined, not structured innovation. And uh, we, uh, we, our, our, um, our uh, aim is to uh, engage this, uh, this, uh, this part of, of innovators and join, make them join our, our network. More than our network, uh, our network our um, community for innovation. Um, we, we think that this is the key and this is the, the, the model we have to follow for uh, a sustainable innovation, innovation that can bring, can face societal challenges and needs of, uh, of, the, of, the, of people, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the different territories uh, or strategic uh, decisions. Thank you. Monica, in one sentence. <laughs> so stakeholders in the room, wake up. <laughs> uh, now you can see how important our task is in Aurora to build the strategy, actually. Because we are talking or speaking now about the family of stakeholders. We have the regional stakeholders, but now you, you are speaking about internal stakeholders, students, academics. Uh, we have to focus on all the national, international, and regional levels, but uh, let me try more than one sentence, two or three maybe. Experts, understanding, synergy, being welcome, connecting. Because you have shown us how important the strategy is because of the segments you have now introduced us. You are the stakeholders by yourselves. We have to reach you. You have to get answers from us. That's the importance, horizontally, vertically. Universities, Aurora, we have to understand that if we would like to build future, if we would like to 
engage the society, we have to understand, we have to know. And that is important at the horizontal and ver vertical, horizontal and vertical level, as I have mentioned. We have to have departments of strategy, not only because it is in a strategic plan. We have to have partners for you, for you, for you. Be it transfer, be it innovation, be it engaging society. We can serve with all the things if we are not only capable, but willing. The willingness is important for us. You can find congratulations for 800. We have celebrated 450, actually, uh, during the last year. But there is a lot of literature there how important university war were, actually. Not only protecting criminals because of the holy uh, land, you can actually uh, step in uh, in the medieval. Coming from that times to actually all present, you are facing innovation transfer centers from university's point of view. You are working with humanities and uh, uh, philosophical faculties, arts and so on. You are actually transferring everything what is sustainable. So we are doing everything and we have to do that as professionals. We have to be partners. And that's the most important sentence I would bring in. Reaching stakeholders should be, shall be, from our point of view, professional understanding, synergy, supporting. It was more than one sentence. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the, the only thing to, to add uh, from my standpoint could be that the, the, how the panel has been structured probably is a bit of the answer. In a time where the new generation learn ChatGPT before we even start writing on a piece of paper, uh, they think the answer will come from some artificial intelligence, humanity, and uh, I mean, uh, literature, heart, is something that is progressively probably lost. Uh, the fact to bring together science, innovation, research, startups, investment, art, all together in a unique conversation probably is a way to keep more the conversation human in the sense of not alternative to artificial intelligence, is a fundamental tool that will help us enhance and accelerate things otherwise we wouldn't be able to achieve. We have artificial intelligence in everything we do in R&D as we speak, and as in the academia and definitely in the industry. But at the same time, understanding that the social impact, the fact that we move from uh, whoever has brought mindset by Carol Dirk, um, you move from a fixed mindset where probably you don't do much innovation because you are you know, stuck into your kind of box. You can move to the grow uh, mindset where you're able to seek opportunity. But then there is a third level that is now more and more evident is the social mindset. So whatever you do as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, as an academia, researcher, inventor, has to have that clear angle of not just do the business, but how this impacts society, how this improve the understanding of art and, uh, and, and us as a human being. Uh, and, and I guess more and more this kind of cross-functional uh, or cross-special Specialty conversation can uh, can be something that move in the direction we need. Thank you. Thank you. What I was also thinking, in addition of this, I am doing the biennial at a conversation with our uh, contact in the international office, just also to loop the students in. And CBS has really high level uh, has mobility with a lot of high level business schools, but the Aurora brings us interdisciplinary exchange. And she said, students come with a different experience back. And I know also here the hackathon from Adam and Rome, Ramon. You have architecture students, you had sociologists, and you had uh, business school uh, students from CBS coming together, working on a, on a um, palace which was dedicated to the poor, thinking about what can you make with this huge building. And the architects and the business students come on, yeah, let's renovate it, make a cool space out of it. And then the sociologists came in, hey, this is a poor area. What does it mean for the rent? What does it mean for the people living here? And this is, these, this is also, I think, one of the fun part of our world to learn from each other from the different disciplines and say, that's true. And then they came up with, with different business models, more social and societal um, impactful business models in a positive way. And at this point, I want to open the floor and use the the next minutes also for you to come up with questions to use the expertise in the room maybe share some 
other Aurora experiences in terms of, of societal engagement? Hello, thank you for um, yeah nice presentations. I, I have a question, um, but especially about, about art and, and, and academia, um, because very interesting what you were presenting. Um, and I, I was wondering, because, um, well, we from the uh, a really a project where we're also trying to to do these kinds of things that you are are, are promoting here in our education um, design. So for new innovative education to, for example, in, in involve art. Uh, so we have a museum as one of the a German uh, museum uh, as one of the partners. Um, but the problem maybe often is, and that I encounter because I'm a lecturer myself, is that when you want to, in, to do very innovative things in education, that you run into a kind of um, difficulties, and they have to do with accreditation, they have to do with uh, the difficulty of, of institutions to allow um, these very, let's say, even as, as extracurricular activities in, into the curricula. And, and I, I was would like to know what your thoughts are, how we can integrate that more into um, um, education, um, in, into regular education, because I think it's very important to, uh, to bring that aspect into um, higher education. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, in Italy, it's true because, uh, for example, there is not a professional for uh, this educational museum. So, if you uh, if you want to have some uh, public uh, job in a museum, there is you have not the opportunity because this uh, figure is not recognized. So that's true. Uh, what we are doing, for example, it's different from country to country. For example, in the United States, of course, uh, they are more advanced than that. So the educational, the, this mission of uh, educational, this educational mission of museums is recognized and has a specific role. Uh, in Italy, not yet. But we are trying to do some pressures, of course. And I think that uh, what uh, a European network, an international network can do is, is that. So trying to uh, press, uh, give a, a, little, a little bit of pressure on the European institution on, on that. And at the same time, trying to change and trying to introduce uh, this uh, training uh, inside, uh, uh, for example, university. We are doing a lot of things uh, uh, with the fine art academias because they are working on that. So it's a double level work. Maybe I can, can add to this as well. The, the hackathon I mentioned, this was this was enabled by Aurora because we had the mobility money to send the students to Napoli. So it gives us a little bit the resources and the sandbox to try. And in the morning, we had the discussion about micro credentials. Maybe this could be also a way to, in terms of lifelong learning, to get this additional discipline into the CV, maybe not in the curricula, but as and on. So we are, work, we are working, excuse me. No, of course, Wait we are working with the uh, Erasmus Plus projects because uh, I think that it's one of the way to go on. Sorry. <laughs> excuse me again, my lady. Uh, we are working together on the uh, uh, Eurydice, uh, actually, um, uh, about the new concepts. But uh, let's think about, uh, uh, from my point of view, most important uh, uh, and actually helping procedure. The students should understand the importance of their study programs and of the curriculas. Uh, starting from the lawyers, actually, there is uh, the European tradition, they, they are studying uh, theoretically, and afterwards they are going to the practice. That's a wrong procedure. Uh, coming to uh, the, uh, let's say, arts and, and humanities, they have to understand the role uh, after the studies of themselves, actually going and, and joining the society. We are missing that point. By the doctoral studies, uh, we are always talking about promoting science, actually, the publicity or uh, uh, speaking about, uh, about the uh, public aspects. They have to understand the role of the scientists uh, after they have actually uh, finished their studies and are joining uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, academical or laboratory or uh, healthcare uh, procedures. And if they understand during the studies, we can bring them together 
actually on the horizontal level, as we have discussed, because of Aurora or because of the universities, starting at the universities and let them join in Aurora procedure. They have to understand what's their future role, not only why would I like to study uh, an surgeon and uh, earn much money as an dentist. That, that's not the point that we should focus on. So that's the first aspect. Secondly, we have to work on such a curricula that will connect joint studies, actually, with the help of the micro-credentials or, let's say, multi-connected curricula. Because that's the future. The people have to understand not only uh, how are their names and where they are coming from, but what are the roles, actually, between each other and the synergies and the connections of the society. That is something what we have missed a little in the European history. Let's focus on that. And thank you all that you are building it via our rights. Really important for me. Silence. <laughs> mm. Thank you uh, for your wonderful presentation. There is an issue that uh, was also raised by our colleagues in the panel on open science and uh, participatory democracy. Uh, in our society, there is a lot of research uh, and innovation going on through society, which is not only provided by institutional actors, not even by private companies, but society itself. We can see these, for example, in our students. Sometimes they are engaged in so many activities. Uh, some of them are really innovative. They have a lot of ideas. Uh, and society as a whole is producing quite a lot. How can we, uh, as Aurora, but also uh, as, a, as a stakeholders, be able not only to transfer our, our knowledge to society, but also support society in uh, uh, developing the intelligence, uh, the skills, and mindset that are already there, and probably without the need of being us teaching, but this time learning from them. May I start? You, you remember maybe the three orange or yellow boxes at the beginning? <laughs> this is, like I said, what also drives me in Aurora, the idea how can we bring and maybe not 12 boxes in one study program or 12 competencies, but that we can a little bit be, be the seed for this and let them already give the sandbox at the university to work international and interdisciplinary. Thank you so much. And, and, and learn these, these competencies or parts of it. And I remember when I presented this to our, our wise team for Green Transition, she was also looking at this. Is this one person or is this a team? This relates perfectly to your presentation and also what you said, bring the right people together. So I hope <clears throat> the education here and the experience also help that we uh, contribute to, uh, to equipping really our students with some of the competencies to go out and live this. And that like the seismic courses, and I think this is also happening in different courses within Aurora, train them and even the popularism, which is, and the need for easy answers, maybe give them also the braveness to see it's complex. But I learned in university, I can tackle this and develop a little prototype. So I hope they go out with a different mindset, what you said, a societal mindset and growth mindset to really address this. This is more the vision. Let's see if we work towards it. Let's do an alumni study in 10 years. But I hope this is what we can also bring or contribute. If I may just add, um, I feel, and I will use the, the Heather McGoal um, adaptation advantage kind of concept here. So what I experienced so far is that speaking to students from the high school to university, uh, mainly in life sciences degrees later on, there is a huge focus by them of saying, okay, I study biotech, I want to do biotech, and I want to enter in a company that pay me a salary as, as quick as possible. Fully understandable. Everyone needs to put bread on the table. At the same time, from that concept of the adaptation advantage, the cycle and the speed of needing to reskill or upskill what you learn over a period of five to ten years, 
it's much quicker. So the message that probably we need to convey to, to young generation is, look, yeah, you study, you graduate as a lawyer, you may end up being a doctor or vice versa. I, I take my experience. I started as a doctor, family doctor, uh, um, family of doctors, always thought I'm going to do huge research, I will be in the hospital and die in the hospital. And then over the sudden I moved into the pharmaceutical industry and there was the most far, far from me uh, industry I could imagine. And then I end up doing interesting things, innovation, learn skills that I, I never learned, and end up also with a sort of entrepreneurial angle. All that has not been teached to me at the university at all, just came over time, right? Uh, I think students today needs to understand that uh, the skills needs to be more, and they need to be flexible in understanding that you start on a pathway, and you may end up in a completely different pathway, but the two are in some way connected. So, and you make the connection as, as, a, as a student. I should show I, my lady. It was an important question, and that's why we have mentioned at the beginning uh, the fifth, five or six pillars, actually, in the strategy of the university. It is not only important to go inside of the university to the internal stakeholders, but we have to focus really on the uh, policy, on the stakeholders in the region uh, and uh, in the municipalities, because they have to prepare their own strategies, how to handle, and they have to understand that we understand what they need. And we are trying now, and we have to try in Aurora, be positively aggressive, as we are trying at the Palatsky University to write the strategies for the regions, for the cities. We have now started with uh, uh, the schools, uh, grammar schools, uh, uh, actually uh, the uh, kindergartens as university institutions. Because we need to prepare all the society to go through this procedure you have mentioned. So we have to stay active and we have to uh, actually focus on the active role of the university in the society in general. So policy uh, representatives and also the other pillars, be it healthcare or SMEs and entrepreneurs and so on, uh, influencing that, building that. That is the most important role for, from the external point of view. And we cannot forget about it, because if we stay out, we will be out. And you have mentioned an important question. That's studying a lawyer, being a doctor afterwards. We have to understand that, that for example, for example, studying medicine does mean that you will need for the future education in legal aspects. Because the society is developing that way. And that's the right approach for the future. And I believe in the universities in that way. Thank you. Looks like you have a lot to digest. So I would maybe say, if Alessandro agrees, let's use the next 10 so, minutes to well, think about it. Well, first of all, thank all of you for this wonderful panel. So, yeah, thank you. What is next? We have a very uh, important moment. Uh, I don't know if the, uh, the board is, is finished, if the colleagues from the Aurora board are already there. I don't think so. Uh, at four, we gather again here uh, because there is the signing of this uh, sustainability agreement. That's a very important moment between uh, the university and Aurora. We have agreed on a plan on reducing the environmental impact of our campuses. It's a complex effort, and thanks to the colleagues who have been working on that. Uh, we have 10 minutes. There is a coffee break for you to take a coffee, but please, in 10 minutes, be again back in this room for the next step of our work. Thank you again to all of you.
excuse me, in a couple of minutes we will start the ceremony of signing. Uh, please, for each institution signing, whether a director or a delegate, to be ready to be called for the signing. We will also briefly present the, the sustainability plan that we are uh, signing. Great, we are ready. Dealing with technologies is always complicated. Uh, we will rely on our colleagues working in the domain of digital society and global citizenship to deal with uh, those kind of things. So we are ready. I'm, again, very much happy to uh, give the floor to Susanna and Lorenzo, who for Aurora have been working very, very hard with our colleagues in the task uh, team on drafting this sustainability plan, uh, giving a huge contribution to Aurora to plan the, the future of our uh, sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability. They will present us a bit the basic of this plan. They will call the signing people for each institution. And it will be uh, for all of us a pleasure to have this document signed uh, within Aurora. So, Lorenzo and Susanna, to you the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, maybe you remember me from uh, the last presentation from All Modes Biannual. I was standing here with my colleague Ivar from, uh, from uh, Holland, and we were presenting this picture. Do you remember that? We were talking about the CO2 emissions from the travels to the biannuals. We didn't count the CO2 emissions this time, but I, I want to ask you, who of you changed your mind and exchanged the plane for a train? Raise the hand. <laughs> oh, okay, we changed some minds, great. <laughs> no, I want to I wanna say I'm really proud of my or our delegation from Czech Republic because almost half of delegation from Olomouc, from Palacki University Olomouc, came by train, even though we are around 15, 16 hours or almost 20 hours away by train. So uh, we did some small impact and we are happy about that. But of course, it's not only about not flying. There are many other aspects that our footprint reduction plan is about. And as we present ourselves uh, as uh, sustainability pioneers, we need to try to do and be a good example for other universities, European universities, but not only European universities. So we, uh, we were three years working on this plan. Lorenzo will shortly uh, introduce us a bit. And we are really proud we came to this moment that we will be signing and all of our universities came into the deal and accepting this, this plan and we are really proud of that. Yeah, also hi from my side. As Susanna said, that's been, uh, how to say, a long journey to get here. The, as you might also know, we already had the Sustainable Campus Action Plan as the first part. Also, to be honest, that was because all those plans were deliverables for the European Universities Project. Uh, sustainable Campus Action Plan, to say it really short, was just saying we all commit to be sustainable universities. There's a common footprint reduction plan, also to say it in one sentence, it's basically the same, but it also adds, and we're going to do something. So um, it's still a, let's say, ah, that's the, what's in it. Like it's a common uh, effort. Every university is committed to sustainability. We have like some, let's say, rather basic uh, commitment to reducing emissions. I mean, and I think we should have it. As you all know, the European Union wants to become carbon neutral, so the universities have to do that sooner or later anyway. And then some common actions which we want to do, those are, let's say, a bit spread out, a bit 
sometimes not very precise, but there are also some things which just make sense. For example, uh, everyone wanting to switch to green electricity, which is, I think, one of the really big things you can achieve rather easily, also doesn't cost really much. Um, yeah, I think that's the main point of the plan. It's about raising awareness. I also want to say like a bit for our next step, because that, I don't know if that has been made clear, was from the first phase of Aurora. We have, that, uh, we have done that and it's kind of finished. I mean, the plans, they were already agreed on and delivered to the commission in, uh, in the last year. That's now just the official and also kind of symbolic signing of them. Um, for the next phase, we will do some, let's say, relatively basic monitoring of sustainability and also focus on showcasing what is actually already been done at the different universities. Um, and for that, we are also going to organize a sustainability summit, probably together with the next biennial. And I hope to see you all there. Great. I think that's it from my side. Um, we are not entirely sure who the persons are which are going to sign the plan. And I think also, I don't know, Alessandro, do you have something to add? No? Okay. In that case, I would like to ask the, I think in most cases, directors are here to come up uh, to the stage. I think most of you also know how it works. We're going to have you sign like one by one, also to take a picture. And then afterwards, like just everyone to stand here for another photo. Great.
Thank you again, Lorenzo and Susana and all of you. There is another uh, very important moment, uh, something that we uh, are very happy and sad at the same time, in a way. Uh, as you know, Yonatli is closing his mandate as a president of Aurora, and the uh, colleague directors of Palatsky is stepping in as a new president of Aurora. So I call to the floor um, Selma. Is she here? Please, Selma, who will be chairing this important moment of passing. This is my gift for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, send you, Selma. So please yawn and please. What is your question? So I'm very honored to have been given this role now to chair the president, president's handover ceremony. Um, well, we've had one president that has left really strong mark on this alliance, and that is Jon Atli from University of Iceland. Is this your first? Yeah. yeah. Yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we would like to thank him from the bottom of our hearts for his very dedicated work, his uh, very strong commitment to the Alliance, to, our, to Aurora Network and Alliance. And uh, we, I would like to give uh, the mic to Yonatli to give us a few words, his observations, Thanks a lot, Selma, and thank you, everyone. I would say, first of all, it's an honor to serve you and the universities. And um, I have been doing this for almost four years. I never expected, actually, to become the president of Aurora, but it was a true honor. And um, I have enjoyed it very much. But I think it's also very important that uh, we have... Uh, some succession and uh, we have a clear plan and uh, what we have decided now is instead of having two years of terms of the president and even two times two like i had we are now working on a new system president elect president and past president and the key is that more universities are involved so i'm very happy that uh, martin Rokaska of uh, Palaki University is taking over as president, and I'm sure it will be the same for him, an honor to serve Aurora. And I would like to thank all of you for uh, working with us. Being the president is just working with you and for you. And uh, thank you for everybody. Thanks to uh, the, the office, the secretary generals who have worked with me, the board members, the general council members, and everyone. And I would in particular like to thank my team at the University of Iceland. You know, they, you know, they do all the job for me, all the work. So I'm just here fronting them and Aurora. So it has been a great pleasure, and uh, I wish you all the best, Martin. As, as a token of our appreciation, we have a little, little, but very heavy and precious gift to you, Yonatli, because you've been precious to us. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, it's a great moment for me now. So, dear Yonatli, dear Aurora friends, it is my honor and pleasure to address you all today. It's a privilege to be a chosen to take over this mantle of our president. And for those, who, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Martin Prochaska. I'm a rector of Palatsky University in Olomouc, Czech Republic, a position I've held since 2021. 
My professional background is obstetrics and gynecology. In these fields, precision and above all, care and understanding are very important. So these values are integral to my vision of our collaborative efforts in Aurora Alliance. First, I would like to thank the Otley for his gigantic contribution to Aurora in his years. Uh, he was acting as Aurora president, modest as he is. Otley did not want to make a big celebration over this handover. So I still would like to give a credit where it is due and offer him this small token as appreciation. Jonathan, this gift is not just a token of our friendship, <laughs> but it, this is also a symbol of uh, your excellent work for Aurora. It's a Czech crystal. Famous for its exquisite craftsmanship, its testament to the blend of tradition and innovation, and that is where we aspire to in, in Aurora. Uh, those of you who know me, no, I'm not a man of many words. As Aurora president, I want to be a facilitator and I want to give a lot of space to all of you. Our universities or Aurora community to express ourselves and to shape the future of Aurora together. My mission is to build bridges, bridges between our cultures, our institutions and the world at large. Our universities Coming together in this manner is a testament to our shared commitment to growing together. This will help us to grow Aurora and expand on our ambitions with global partnerships. I have already met with the Student Council. Their enthusiasm and ideas are a source of inspiration for us all. As a president, it will, be my main, it will be my main goal to continue working on creating student-centered and inclusive environment within Aurora, where the students are truly heard. In closing, now more than ever, let us reaffirm commitment to peace and stability for future European generations. Aurora's efforts today are not just for our own advancement, but for the betterment of society. Together, hopefully, we can build a future where our universities pave the way for a brighter, peaceful tomorrow. I would like to thank you. It's really very heavy. Can I say just a few words? So, uh, again, thank you very much. I, I have worked with Martin for a couple of years now. And I can assure you, Aurora is in great hands with the president. So, again, congratulations and good luck, and thanks for the very kind words to me and the wonderful gift. But Aurora with you, Martin. So, the day is closing, but we still have one more step before we leave, the photo session. Hmm? Please, Maria Jose. Yeah. Uh, before we do the photo session, Maria Jose will give us some information about tomorrow. Then I will also give you some information about the social uh, events this afternoon. Then we will move for the photo session uh, on the stairs, sulle scale. Do you think it's probably the best place so that we can be? Huh? Because I think in this room, it's, it's, too, it's not enough big for all of us. So, Maria, please. Thank you, Alessandro. No, it's just something very tiny about tomorrow's first session. That is the work package uh, leads and co-leads uh, workshop. Uh, we have got some questions about who is invited. The answer is everyone that wants to be there. So, ideally, the work uh, package leads and co-leads, but also the task team leads and co-leads, ICs, work package and task team members, everyone. Uh, it is, you don't have to prepare anything. Uh, we're going to have a very short informative session at the beginning, and then is just picking your brains on some um, questions to reflect on our uh, impact and future, etc. So please, you are all welcome, and uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you. Great, Maria. Indeed. 
for those of you who are not not interested but who would rather prefer not to participate for the so many various reasons uh, feel free to join us at 11 for the coffee break then we have a, I would say a relevant and very much important panel run by the students and we really would like to have all of you tomorrow to listen to our students and uh, greet them with all the work they do that it's far more difficult than uh, ours uh, concerning social events tonight for those of you who have registered these are the uh, meeting point uh, for the those of you who wants to visit shortly the city the meeting point is a quarter to six in uh, uh, Piazza San Domenico Maggiore you should have received an email hmm, with the with the address uh, Piazza San Domenico Maggiore is near the rectorate so if you go near the Cortile delle Statue where we met yesterday it's basically there for those of you who would like to visit the museum, the entrance of the museum is in Via Mezzocannone 8, basically the main entrance of the main building for the Cortile delle Statue. For those of you who would like to visit the Fondazione Morra, then the timing is a bit different because there is a bit to walk to do, but it's a very nice walk. The meeting point is a quarter past five at the entrance of the main building of the Federico II in Corso Umberto I 40. Again, you have received the email for any doubt, just ask to me. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us will meet at 7 in Cortile delle Statue. We will have a light dinner together and there will be some music. Uh, I hope we will all of us see there uh, later. So if we can move to the stairs outside we can have the photo session all together thank you for being today with us